morning, everyone, and welcome to MindSpeak. And it's a real privilege to have Jacques Peterloo, His Excellency Jacques Peterloo, the Swiss ambassador to most of East Africa, <laughs> not only Nairobi. And uh, as I was thinking and I was composing what I was going to say, it's quite a difficult thing because we met many years ago when Jacques first came here, and we've been friends for all that time. So some of this, some of what I'm saying is quite sad to see him go. Um, I think you're going on July the 14th, is it? Back to Switzerland. But he's taking over um, as the Director General of the, of the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, correct? Uh, the budget of that, of his job is 3.2 billion Swiss francs, which is more than I think all our top three exports. Um, and, uh, but Jacques is, is so he, a very big role is going back to, but today we're going to talk about Jacques' observations of Africa and what he, what he is, what, what he thinks about how the economy is looking. Are we rising? Is it the real deal? But let me just tell you a few things uh, that I've learned. Jacques is, of course, a diplomat par excellence, and I think an outlier in the Swiss diplomatic corps, if I might say that, <laughs> because I don't think there are many Peter Lewis around. Um, a polymath, uh, reads incredibly widely. We've, we've shared, he shared books with me, and a really interesting uh, 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 sort of appetite for reading. A birder, a birder is somebody who loves birds. We once were in the Samburu, and there was a leopard in the tree, and everyone was looking at the leopard. And Jack says to me, Ali Khan, and I look round, and it's the bird. And I say, Jack, look, it's the leopard. <laughs> um, <laughs> so really, really incredible. And he has been at the cold face of world events. Our, you know, Jack arrested uh, genocidaires in Rwanda and took them to Arusha for trial. He's been in Bosnia. Uh, 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 he knows Sepp Blatter. A week before everything blew up at FIFA, he, had a, he met him about something else. <laughs> so if, uh, from presidents, I, it, Jacques mentioned that he showed, he's put together a book of, bird, of birds in Kenya and gave it to the president. And the president was going through it and saying, but Jacques, you've been to more places than I have been to in Kenya. Because, of course, if you love birds, you're going to all kinds of places on our, in our country. And the biggest quality, I think, from my point of view, is a humbleness, an ability to engage a president of FIFA, a president of Kenya, but also an ability to engage at every level of our society. I've been to... Jack's house, and you'll find a civil activist like Boniface. You'll find a president, maybe, or a head of a massive multinational. You, there, there was, in, in Jack's house, an ability to reach everyone. Um, and, and I think that is such a great quality in somebody. He was telling me that he, when he was training uh, people about, or when he was talking to people about to into the foreign service, he said to them, take a pin and put it anywhere on the atlas and then think of how a person in that place envisages the world around them. And that's such a wonderful way to be thinking, right? You're thinking from somebody else's point of view. You're not thinking all the time from your own point of view. It made a big impression when he said that. And there are those who say and there are those who do. Jack is a person who says and does as well. As I said, 3.2 billion Swiss francs, and the Swiss franc is a very valuable currency <laughs> these days. <laughs> Keeps you too, too much, much so. And the Swiss are trying every... This, whilst we're worrying about our currencies going down, the Swiss have the incredible option that they're worrying about their currency going up. I think we'd all like to worry the same way, I'm sure. So enormous budget, enormous responsibility, the Swiss, of course, have been at the forefront of diplomacy for many years. Uh, the U.S. did not have an embassy in Tehran, for example. The Swiss 
represented uh, uh, um, U.S. interests. In fact, Jack will be very modest, but Jack has been to the U.S. State Department to negotiate with the U.S. in these matters. So huge insights into big events that are happening today, will Iran, um, uh, and the U.S. finally um, to get to the altar in the next few weeks. Will that change the Middle East? Jack has been dealing with those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, people talk about Switzerland, and I think the incredible success is, of Switzerland is, some, is their fluency, their ability to trade around the world, big businesses that are all over the world. And I call it globally fluent. They are fluent. Sometimes you wouldn't think that because the Swiss have a reputation for being very Swiss, you know, and, and looking at everything in a certain way. Like, you know, if it, the, tr the train is late, if it's a second late, you know, that, that's late. But it's, I think, that global fluency that Jacques represents that I really appreciate and I think is extraordinary. And of course, here we've seen him do so many things, been a big player in the anti corruption drive. Um, uh, has been at the forefront of, 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 of that as well. And there are so many things that we can't, that, you know, I can't talk about because they were of extraordinary sensitivity, but I can guarantee you that Jacques has seen everything, has seen more than some of us have seen. And it is a real privilege to have Jacques here today. And uh, I, I'm grateful that you've made the time because I know you weren't feeling well and you are going in a very short time. But I thought this is an opportunity we couldn't miss to hear from someone like yourself. And when I said to Jacques, what are you going to speak about? He said, I'm going to speak about Africa, about the Renaissance, and having observed it for five years, up close and personal. Jacques. Thank you very much, uh, Alikan, for these very, very kind words. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first, the first thing I would like to say is that it, it's going to be very tough to leave Kenya because Kenya is an extraordinary country uh, where I'm, I, I would say I have spent the best five years of my life. Uh, this is a country where everything is more intense than any place I've been uh, to before, uh, starting with you know, uh, the quality of individuals you, you, you meet. In this country, the bad guys are real bad guys, like in the Hollywood movie. Uh, or even, or even worse, or even worse, and the good guys are heroes because they are they are fighting uh, uh, against very difficult odds. It's pretty easy to be a, a hero in in Europe, where the main risk that you incur is to be maybe once arrested by the police, but they will be very careful uh, not to not to harm you because they would end up in court. This is a very different proposition. So leaving Kenya, where everything is extreme, where the beauty is extreme, where the, 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 the wealth is extreme, but at the same time poverty uh, is, is incredible. So a country where you can't spend a day without just uh, being either let's say, very unhappy about what you're seeing or, or totally flabbergasted by the quality of the people you meet, that is something that I'm going to miss because I'm going back to a country uh, which I love, of course, and I do represent, but where everything is a bit boring because it's so well organized and the trains are running on time and the streets are clean and politics are so boring that you couldn't even imagine I mean, uh, there is never, you know, if there is a slide of 2% in, in the votes in the national elections, it's like an earthquake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's a very strange country. Uh, let, let, let me maybe say a few words about Switzerland and the reason why we are so different. If I were to ask any of you to give me the name of a single Swiss politician, uh, he would know because my president, Madame, she's retired, was in Nairobi uh, four years ago, so he would know the name of one Swiss politician. Uh, but otherwise, not, I'm sure nobody would be able to do that. And the reason is that our system is a system that shuns and hates leaders. We don't believe in big men or big women, for that matter. Uh, we, our government is organized like a board of directors. So there is Swiss, Switzerland Incorporated, and Switzerland Incorporated has a board of directors. We have this system whereby uh, each big political party has at least one representative in government. So we have seven ministers. 
you could take a, a leaf out of these seven ministers, you know, it's much cheaper than to have uh, 42, uh, um, you know, uh, they, um, they are being, uh, if they take the helicopter once a year because they are really in a hurry, they will be criticized so heavily in the newspapers uh, that the next time they will take the car. Uh, normally they take the train or the bus. Um, and nobody, nobody knows them really and nobody cares because it's about, it's about organizing uh, the country and making sure, making sure that the country functions. When President Obama, a few weeks ago, said expressly referring to the situation in East Africa, men or humans are not important, institutions are important. Uh, it, I, I think Switzerland is the best illustration uh, of this system because we have very, very strong institutions and you could have some sort of terrorist outfit taking, uh, taking out the whole of the government tomorrow and Switzerland would probably barely notice because we would replace them the next day. The institutions are functioning. So, you know, whom do you kill if you want to do a military coup in Switzerland? Where do you go? Where do you go? You know, whom do you take down? You know, the system will keep on, keep on working. So that's the strength of, uh, of our system. On the other hand, one has to be very... Um, aware that this is a system that, can, that cannot be exported, cannot be exported because it's the product of seven years, 700 years of history with a lot of civil wars, which is also widely ignored, uh, of uh, uh, devolution from the bottom to the top. So it was small communities uniting, not because of their love for each other, but because they were more afraid of the big neighbor than of the small neighbor, so they would work with the small neighbor. And slowly, 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 we, 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 we united into some sort of a country. I'm, I always hesitate to say a nation because I'm not sure we are one. We are more a community of interest. Um, you know, um, certainly many people in this room are representatives of cultures where arranged marriages are still uh, pretty common. And you know what? Quite often they, they work as well as the uh, marriage of love. And Switzerland is typically a marriage of interest, of people who have very different, different religions, different languages, different systems. But, um, so, so, but it's, it's a unique system which cannot be exported. So don't expect the arrogant Muzungu to come and say, you know, this is how we do it and everybody should do the same. It wouldn't work, I think, anywhere else. Um, when I was a very young diplomat, uh, and uh, we had this introduction, you know, you have elder ambassadors coming to, um, to speak about their experience and to tell you uh, what diplomacy should be about. This guy came, he was very funny, and the opening statement was, to be a good diplomat, it's not enough to be stupid, you should also be very polite. <laughs> um, I've done, I've done my level, level best to be stupid, but by nature, I'm, I'm not terribly polite. That's probably the part of Switzerland I, I, I come from. No, I think diplomacy has changed a lot. Diplomacy is not anymore, uh, you know, the kind of uh, you have no opinion, you are absolutely uh, nice to everybody, uh, you defend the interests of your country, uh, but you do it in a very, very discreet manner. I think diplomacy has evolved. Diplomacy is about friends speaking to each other. And frankly, we are friendly with everybody, uh, including Kenya. Uh, so, so we have no reasons. If you speak to friends, and sometimes you see your friend doing something you think is stupid, you tell him so. Otherwise, you're not a friend. If you see something, if you can help your friend, you will help your friend. But it's not a bit about being just polite and never, and, and never uh, 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 saying the truth. And so I've, I've had very interesting moments in my five years in, in Kenya. I remember being accused by some political scientist, who by the way, he was one of these trolls, because nobody had ever heard of him, so somebody was behind the name. He was, he, he was a non-existing political scientist who wrote a column in the nation saying that uh, Western countries, including Switzerland, were at war with Kenya. And it was because we had been criticizing some aspects of Kenya's uh, uh, foreign policy. So we were at war with Kenya. Uh, so I remember other columns saying that I'm a very good friend of Kenya. You know, in the end, I think I've tried really to be a, a, a friend of Kenya and to help where I could help. Um, 
I remember when we were criticizing some aspects, and we as the, let's say, the Western ambassadors, we were criticizing uh, the, the, some aspects of the Jubilee campaign. We were branded by, by certain uh, newspapers and by people mm -hmm. on the internet as being the enemies of Kenya. Uh, and now I have been branded not so long ago uh, uh, a kind of uh, appeasement diplomat uh, by certain members of civil society <laughs> because I'm working with the government. But you know the government, this government is the government that has been elected. This government has the responsibility of Kenya at least for the next two years. And w our, our goal is not to criticize it, is to work with it. So it's a difficult balance that you have to, to strike, especially if you try to be a bit more than just stupid and, and polite. Uh, now, when I came in 2010, there was a wave of optimism about Africa in general and East Africa in particular. Kenya was about to vote. I came three days, I think, before the vote on the new constitution. There was this wind of, of hope that the new constitution would change everything. The international community was about to uh, literally give birth to the new uh, baby of the international community called South Sudan. Uh, Burundi was doing pretty well in trying to keep uh, all the promises of the Arusha agreement, Burundi was doing actually fairly well. Uh, at least, if I may be a bit cynical and sarcastic, they were not killing each other. And they hadn't been killing each other for, for seven years. So we were very, very happy. You know, the, the development was maybe not there, but at least peace and security was there. So there was a, there was a huge wave of optimism in, uh, in, in, in the region. I'm leaving this region five years later, and let me tell you, I'm not terribly happy. I'm not terribly happy because I've seen many things happening. I don't have to dwell on what's happening in southern Sudan. I don't have to dwell on the fact that the Arusha Agreement is being violated uh, by the events in, uh, in Burundi. Uh, we were hoping by then that there would be a lasting peace in Eastern, Con in a lasting peace in Eastern Congo. We are not there yet. Uh, and Kenya is going also through a, a fairly difficult, difficult time. So where does the whole narrative of Africa rising uh, end up with all this? Um, five years ago, the whole so-called developed world was still reeling from the consequences of the, uh, let's say, economic and financial crisis of 2008. So there was a lot of money out there that desperately needed investment. The money was there, but you, you couldn't invest in, 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 in Germany, you couldn't invest in Switzerland, you couldn't. So, so you needed new markets. And that's when the new uh, uh, Africa narrative, the rising Africa, emerged. Um, I remember all these comments. I mean, you all remember probably. You know, a few years ago, The Economist saying uh, Africa, the hopeless continent. And then a few, a few years later, what was the title again? 2002. I yeah, that was 2002, was the, the hopeless continent. 2012, Africa rising. Africa rising in 2012. Mm -hmm. Like everywhere else, the, the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, when people say Africa is the Asia of the 21st century, well, it might very well be if you take a hard look at Asia. Asia developed in an incredible, incredible manner in the, in, the 90s, uh, in the 90s and in the years 2000, but it was a very uneven development. Asia has not become a first world continent in a matter of 20 years. Some countries have done extremely well. Singapore, Thailand to a point, China of course, uh, one could speak about yeah, well, there are quite, quite a few examples. And there are still huge pockets of poverty. Asia as a continent has not yet really taken off. So if this is the example for the Africa rising of the 21st century, yes, then I do agree with it. Africa is bound to become an extremely interesting market. It is bound to evolve. It is bound to, uh, to <coughs> catch up on many, many, many things. Uh, but as a continent, as a whole, it's not going to happen. It's just not, not going to happen. Uh, some countries will succeed, other, <laughs> others won't. And that brings me to Kenya. Kenya should be, by right, 
one of the countries that's going to be one of the rich countries of the second half of the 21st century. But I'm speaking about rich countries, not just you know, doing well and uh, plodding along rich. Will it succeed? That will depend on a number, on a number of factors. Um, you remember, for those of you who read the Bible and the New Testament, uh, the story of the master who goes on a trip and so he gives one talent to uh, uh, one of the servants, and five talents to another one, and ten talents uh, to the third one. And uh, the one who has one talent makes it fructify, and when the master comes back, he gives him five back. The, the one who got five talents buries them and then gives them back. And the one who had ten talents just squanders them and go on a drinking spree or whatever, futaska. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then the master is not happy when he comes back. Kenya has received, in my opinion, not 10 but 20 talents. God was absolutely unfair to, this con to, to the rest of the countries in Africa because this country has got so much more. You have the best geostrategic situation anybody can think of. I mean, it's just, just so unfair. You're just so well placed. You have the most incredible natural beauties. You have been blessed by the late discovery of mineral resources, so you didn't have to fight with the mineral curse that so many other countries have been fighting with. You have, a, what's and all, with all the problems, the best infrastructure any sub-Saharan African country can dream of, at least north of the Limpopo. You have an education system that is second to none. In, uh, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, you have an economy that is the only sub-Saharan economy with the three sectors, where the three sec sectors are really existing. Um, anywhere you go in Africa, or for, for that matter, anywhere else, the surest sign of underdevelopment is if the main taxpayer is the brewery. You know, that's the reality. If the main taxpayer is the brewery, it means it's the only industry there, uh, and, and they are the main taxpayers. Uh, so, so, but it's not really producing wealth. It's producing drinks, which is okay. Uh, have they disbanded uh, Nakada or not? not yet. No, not yet. No, no, they haven't disbanded Nakada. Okay. But here in, in, here in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, the two main taxpayers, and Nikhil will correct me if, if I'm wrong, are alternatively either the biggest bank, KCB, or Safaricom. So we're speaking about services, which is incredible. Look at how many countries in Africa can, can boast of the, such a tax situation. This is incredible. So Kenya should, by right, be the country leading this African renaissance. The African renaissance is possible, but, but. For the last six months, the growth in Kenya has been actually slowing down. Look at the numbers. Of course, you are starting from much higher up than any other country in the region, but now the official numbers are 4.7. 4, 4.9. Or 4.9. You remember the, all the predictions that it would be a 7, and then it went down to 6, and then it went down to 5.5, 5, and now we are at 4.9. Um, other countries in the region who start from a much lower level, granted, uh, have reached a growth rate that, that is much more, much, more, much more impressive. Okay, why is that? And here, sorry, I'm going to be uh, to breach the rule of diplomacy in the sense that, uh, on top of being stupid, I will not be polite. Uh, <laughs> it's a problem of governance. It's a problem of governance. This country should have a growth of 15 percent. You have all the ingredients to have this country take off like a rocket. It could take off like a rocket. Everything is there. Why isn't he taking? Isn't the country taking off? because of problems of governance. And over these years that I've spent here in Kenya, I have tried to identify the cardinal sins of this country. You know, by the way, I have also identified the cardinal sins of Switzerland. You know, we are boring, we are dull, we lack, we lack fantasy, uh, we, uh, we, um, we are so conservative in the way that we deal uh, with, with our money that we sometimes uh, 
lack or we miss opportunities to do something really, really brilliant, you know, you will never see any, any big initiative, any brilliant initiative uh, coming out of Switzerland because, you know, it's not our kind of, uh, of things, except that we are just about to finish uh, f flying, flying around, the flying. No, 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 no. We, we they have reached Hawaii, but but yes. we still have to fly the rest of the ah. of the globe. The the solar plane, you know, the first the first uh, the first ones to 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 fly around the world in a solar plane. But okay, we have we have our sins, we have our problems too. But um, but when I speak to friends about my observations of the last five years, I'll speak about what I've seen that doesn't actually help this country. You know, if I would to ask, if I were to ask you. What is the first cardinal sin of Kenya as a society? I, I'm, I'm quite sure you would all come to the same conclusion. Greed. Greed has reached proportions in this country that are about to kill your chances of being the, let's say, the leading country of Africa rising in the 21st century. You know, greed is not necessarily bad. I don't think there is a nation that is not greedy, that doesn't want to, 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 to make money. But greed, when it becomes so short-term, when it is about what matter if I can make 100 bob today, if I can steal 50 bob uh, tomorrow, if I can steal 50 bob today, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. And there is a love for shortcuts in Kenyan society that is really destroying the chances of this economy to really take off. Because an economy can only grow and grow in ep epic proportions, which should be the case in Kenya, if you're ready to invest in the future. But it's so difficult to, to see uh, uh, um, investment in the future in this country. So that, that, is, that is certainly one of the first cardinal th uh, uh, scenes of, of this country. The second one, and you will not be surprised that I'm mentioning it, is corruption. Corruption is a fact of life. Corruption is a fact of life in any society. Corruption will never be eradicated from any society, including the so virtuous Swiss or Scandinavians or Dutch or whatever. We have our corruption cases. We, uh, but when corruption becomes a way of life where you Basically, if you do things the right way, you are stupid. If you work hard, you try to create wealth, you pay your taxes, you do not take shortcuts, then you are stupid. Then you are stifling any chance of the country to take off. So when my friends in civil society blast me for trying to help President Kenyatta in his uh, anti-corruption drive, uh, I have, to tell him, I have to tell them, you are utterly and absolutely wrong. You know, I know I've heard it so many times, you know, this is a hopeless battle, you know, you're being led by the nose, uh, uh, this is never going to, to, to succeed, the system is too resistant to any attempt at correcting it, so why are you doing this? You, you're just one, one more of these naive Muzungos, you know, who believe what, whatever uh, a Kenyan politician is trying to, to, to make them do. Well, the question is not, um, is it hopeless? Uh, we have to do it. We have to do it together. We have to try and fight impunity in corruption matters, because otherwise this country is not going to take off. And when the president shows resolve, and let me, let me be absolutely clear about this, when we have been working together on anti-corruption, at every step of the way, there were attempts, and believe me, you know the kind of attempts, to derail the process. There were attempts to buy this civil servant, to buy this judge, to buy this guy, because it's the way things are done. I can buy my way out of this. It did not happen because State House was showing political resolve not to let the process being derailed. Will we succeed in the end? Well, you know, battles are finished when, when they are finished. And we might, I might very well in a, in a few years come back and say we, we, we failed. But at least so far, you know, we have been trying. And we've been trying to do it for, uh, for the Kenyan people and for Kenya. 
Um, I'm sure there are quite a few representatives of the middle class. I mean, the real middle class, not only the very wealthy, but the middle class in this room. And one of the cardinal sins I can identify uh, in, in Kenyan society is it is the most ap apathetic middle class I've seen in my life. I've never seen something like this. And now I'm going to use a very uh, uh, undiplomatic word. You're being screwed all the time. <laughs> but all the time. But so, so you're there. You spend three hours in the traffic, but in your car. So you have a car, so it's nice. You know, I, I finally have a car. Th three hours to go to work. You will be um, looted on the way either by the city Ascaris or by policemen pretending that you've broken uh, rules. No, then you will, you, 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 you will go to work, then you will drive another three hours to go back home, uh, or then you will find somebody from Neymar who claims that you've cut a tree and you shouldn't have cut the tree but you should talk nicely to him so he, will, he won't report that you've cut the tree. Uh, then you will have the guy from Kenya Power coming and saying that, and as long as you can buy that new flat screen television, you're happy. Ooh. That this is incredible. I, can't, I just can't understand how you can, you can tolerate these kind of things. Because it's your money being stolen, it's your hard work being reduced to, 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 to nil, it's your society that's, that's being actually uh, uh, taken away, the, 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 sh the chance is being taken away for this society to really take off, and it's okay as long as I can muddle through. In any country in the world, in history, revolutions have been made by middle class. Now middle class, let's face it, I'm, I'm not advocating a, 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 a revolution, a violent revolution. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's very un-Swiss, you know, it's very un-Swiss. We, 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 don't, we don't do these things, you know, we are, we are. But what I'm advocating is for you to, to, to make your voice heard, to make your voice heard. Uh, it's incredible, you know, when parliamentarians who have never worked a single day in their life, I mean worked, decide to give themselves a pay rise that is just spectacular, a pay that you will never dream even of having, you know, are you there when there is a demonstration against that? Of course you're not, because you're busy buying that new flat screen television. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but the, you know, this, this is where uh, the middle class has to take politics into their own hands. I think that's, that's a, key, a key moment. And the next one, uh, the, my fourth cardinal scene of Kenyan society, is that an, um, um, the private sector doesn't really try to do what it should be doing. The private sector in this country is producing, is the only one producing wealth, producing jobs, producing the kind of, of uh, dynamism that is propelling the country forward. And the, 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 the private sector is mum on politics, on corruption. On the, the private sector has been used since independence and even before to uh, accommodate whoever was in power. You just, you know, you find your way. And in the process, maybe you'll pay less, less taxes than you should, and you know, and whatever. But so you accommodate them. And the private sector, which is the best, the best in Africa, I mean, it's an impressive private sector you have here, always refrained from meddling into politics, always refrained from saying what should be said, always refrained from touching these guys out there who are clamoring for a better governance. You never help them, or if you do, then it's in, you know, very hidden. Uh, you try to show clearly that you don't belong to them, uh, the private sector. Um, a country can only come and go forward if the private sector and the middle class work together to impose upon politicians a better governance. You know, politicians, they are all over the world, they are the same. And it's not a Kenyan specialty. You know, politicians, it's about power and access to, to wealth. Okay, uh, in Switzerland we have solved the problem. They have almost no power. 
Uh, and uh, if you want wealth, you don't become a politician because their pay is really ridiculous. A member of parliament in Switzerland, at the na national parliament, yeah, exactly. well, he earns less than an MCA in Migori. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's the reality. You, you know, in, in Switzerland, you can't be a parliamentarian and just live off the proceeds of your political life. It doesn't exist. So you have to have a real job. You have to have a job. Is that right? It's, yeah, that's right. So only if you become a member of the board of directors, sorry, of the government, uh, then, then you will get enough to, to, to live on. You know, so, so, so you then get dedicated people who are trying to do, to do the, 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 the best thing. Um, after five years in this country, I am personally convinced that this country still has a chance to take off. Because I've met the most extraordinary people the most extraordinary people. Uh, people I'm, I'm proud to call my friends, people I'm, I look you know, at like I'm really admiring them. And you're not my age when you're uh, 53, you know it takes a lot until you admire somebody because you've seen so, so much. You know? And I've seen people who impress me so much in the private sector people who are real entrepreneurs, people who are trying to do the right thing. You see now a new breed of CEOs in this country that are just way beyond the old shortcuts, you know, and I will create a, uh, I will create a company by first grabbing a few thousand hectares of land, and then I will uh, use them as a collateral to buy a company where I will produce products that are actually good for nothing, but I will make sure with government that I am the one selling the products and then they will take their cut. You know, this is over. You can see now a new breed of CEOs that are really, really, really impressive. And, and, and I'm not going to name names because otherwise they will, they will, feel, they will feel embarrassed uh, on, on Twitter or whatever. But we, we all know who they are, people who, are, who would succeed in any economy, not just in the Kenyan economy. Then we have uh, members of civic, so I, I, I want to use the, 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 the word civic society instead of civil society, because civil society now has become a misused word. Uh, you have real heroes out there who are fighting for you, fighting for your rights. When Boniface Mwangi gets beaten up by city Ascaris, almost, you know, like in a basement, because he went to defend Boda Boda riders, and he, was, and he was holding in his hand the directive by the Chief Justice, saying that you can't arrest somebody on a flimsy ground and put him for 24 hours in a cell, and you cannot impound the bike like this just because you, you want to extract money from him. And then the, guys, the guy gets beaten up pretty badly in the basement of, uh, of City Hall. He's defending you. He's defending you because you are being harassed all the time. He, you know, he's fighting for you. And when I see the trolls on the internet, you know, saying he should have taken more of a beating because he's disrespecting whatever the authorities. Uh, oh, you know, you should, you should go and see that what the trolls are writing on the, on the internet. It's, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Um, oh, that, that, just a sideshow. Let me speak about respect. I come from a part of Switzerland where there is no such thing as respect for the authorities. When I go home and, you know, I sit down at the cafe where I usually have my beer with friends, <coughs> they will ask me, oh, and what do you do, what do, you do nowadays? And they say, oh, well, you know, I'm ambassador in, in Kenya. And they say, oh, you're the guy doing the visas. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I say, yeah, 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 I'm the, I'm the, I'm the guy doing the, the visas. And they say, oh, fine, I say, okay, have a beer. And that's it. And that's it. You know, there is no Mwashimiwa, Your Excellency, your whatever, you know. You know? And when, when I'm taking the train in Bern, because very soon I'm going to take the train in Bern again, uh, when I'm taking, taking the train in Bern, I may, I may, may very well be waiting for the train next to my president, who is going home after work. You see? So here, the respect for authority and the respect for elders has been really abused by the political system. You know? If you say anything, oh, you are being disrespectful to your MCA, to your president, to your whatever, bloody hell, they are your employees. 
you have elected them to do something for you. If, if you don't like what they're doing, uh, you, you are totally entitled to say so, as long as you do it in a, you know, there are certain, certain manners, certain forms that you should, uh, but that was just a small sideshow about respect. One of the, the reasons why I think Kenya still has a unique, a unique position is because of what happened in 2002. This country, warts and all, with all the problems that you are facing, is a free country. Freedom is key. Freedom to do something economically, freedom to speak your mind out, to say what you think, freedom to criticize, in spite of all the obstacles and the PBO Act that's anyway never going to, 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 to happen, uh, you know, but this is a free country. And when you're covering many, many countries and when you've been around in the world and you go back to Kenya and you land at JKIA and you feel like the guy, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the movie, uh, it was not Rob Roy, but the other one about Scotland, like, you feel like shouting, freedom, freedom, because this is a free country. This is a country which is incredibly lively, incredibly, and where personally I'm convinced that this alliance of the people who are trying to, to bring this country forward, the, the private sector, the middle class, civic society, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I'm looking forward to coming back to, to, to Kenya as a tourist in a few years and seeing this country incredibly changed. What happened in 2002 in, in the following years in spite of the horrible hiccup of 2008 and the violence and the blood, which is inexcusable. But this country is unique in Africa. You can speak your mind, you can do things, you can, it's, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. And, uh, and of course it's messy. Of course if you come from say some certain cities in the region where the streets are so, cl so clean and the security is 100%. Uh, and, then, and then you land at, at JKIA and Nairobi is messy. A bit less so now because they are preparing for Obama's visit. But uh, um, okay, uh, you know. Uh, of course it's messy, it's dirty, it's dangerous. There is, the, you know, and, and the city Ascaris are trying to harass you and whatever. But it's a free country. And this is something, uh, uh, the other day I was paying my last visit to former President Kibaki, and you know, whatever, whatever one might think of the years uh, he spent in government, but, but, but that is certainly something that he did that will go down in history. When every time the old reflexes were taking, you know, the better of his people, and they would say, you know, this guy has said something, we should lock him up or whatever, and he would say, ah, Maria Kuku. Bore kabisa, apa na? He would say. He would say, "Is this guy a Kenyan?" It was always his standard answer. Is this guy a Kenyan? And he would say, "Yes, he's a Kenyan." Okay, then let him do. And this is something I'm personally absolutely convinced nobody will ever change again. Once you've breathed, breathed breathe the, the 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 smell of freedom, nobody can take it away from you. Uh, nobody will change that. And that's my best hope uh, for, for the future of Kenya, as an introduction. <laughs> Thank you.